Just beyond the manicured lawns of the Runnymede Hotel, and further than table service can reach, lies a wild patch of brambles and weeds. In 1975, the newly built M25 motorway had reached the Thames, and construction on a bridge was about to begin. Although the area looked of little significance, a field archaeologist decided to investigate. Through the overgrowth and dirt, the archaeologist came to a layer of clean river silts and underneath found dark soil, an undisturbed archaeological layer. Jutting from the earth were a few pieces of rough, browny black prehistoric pot. The pottery at first glance did not appear to be anything special, but he had just made one of the greatest Bronze Age discoveries in the UK. So when you excavate, one of the things which is very fascinating is that everything, every movement you make changes what you're looking at. So excavation is a very particular connection between your eyes, your brains and your hands. It's actually making those connections between deposits, between walls, between structures, between, and actually understanding how a site has been used in the past. It's almost like a series of logic puzzles, I guess, and it's, you know, working out what happened next or what happened earlier um, within that sequence. You are interpreting as you as you dig and that's when you're coming up with the narratives and there's a danger I think that if we don't um, excavate we're not actually developing the narratives that we need to tell we just end up with um, endless um, data and no story. could talk about it as to striptease at taking off layers, but that assumes that there's a core that you are aiming at and that each layer aim at that core, but that's slightly wrong metaphor because each layer is in itself the information. It's not that you're digging down for something, it's the thing you're digging through which where the knowledge sits. Because excavation is just the gathering of raw data really, it's just you know you're, you're, you're producing a data set and then the interesting part, I guess, of any site is that what happens when you come off site and you actually start working through that data set and making connections and making, um, I guess, interrogating that data that you have. One often talk about excavation being something which cannot be repeated. As soon as you've done it, you've destroyed the thing you've seen. But it makes it 
a very exciting thing because it's very unpredictable. The process of excavating is the, the way that we actually um, build a story or analyse the information in order to build a story. And if we don't do that, we've just got data. It's not a meaningful narrative. So one could use the metaphor of an onion, as if which you use metaphors, which is about as if you're getting to a core, a truth in the centre, or you get to the naked body at the end of striptease. It's not that we're digging down to find something. We are digging through something, which is history. History sits in the soil which have accumulated. Little was known of prehistoric Southeast Britain prior to the Iron Age. Until the excavation at Runnymede, only assumptions about life here could be made because of the lack of archaeological evidence. With the sheer volume of artefacts discovered, the ordinary and everyday of Bronze Age society was now beginning to take shape. So the clues about what kind of site that Ronomy is, is partly the absence of certain kind of clues. It's not clearly a house with its post and its entrance and fireplace and so on. So it's not a straightforward settlement in that sense. It's not clear whether there was a permanent settlement there. There is evidence of settlement, but it's not clear that it was occupied um, all year round. Bear in mind that the, the structures that we're talking about are probably post-built. Um, and you're in a floodplain environment where you've got a lot of river activity. So it's quite likely that a lot of the material has been um, muddied or smeared or washed away. Unless they go around building things using nice little rings of posts and so on, and those are fairly deeply set, you probably won't get any evidence for building at all. This is not an area where we easily find timber buildings. And then there's also clues in terms of the amount of material. So for example, the amount of bones, the amount of food, the amount of pottery, and the kind of range of pottery, which suggests this is not just a family. And at the time, if it was a settlement, you would just expect it to be a, a kind of extended family. It wouldn't be lots of people. This is one of the densest concentrations in the whole of Britain for late Bronze Age material. There's so many pieces of pot, there's so many um, animals that have been slaughtered and, and consumed at this site. So it's, it's not about really the particular object, it's about the sheer quantity of objects that make this site special. So one of the challenges at Ronomy is to see if we can peel back from here we have a lot of discard, a lot of rubbish, to what was the activity which caused that rubbish to develop. And that has been a bit difficult. Is there evidence of food consumption apart from the rubbish from it? Is there evidence of what the pottery was used for? So we don't just have rub uh, pottery as rubbish. So the uh, aspect of size, which is wrong for a settlement, and also aspect of structural elements which are missing for it to be settlement. And that means we had to, to think anew, what kind of site could it possibly be? If you think of the residue that's left over after a party, all the beer cans and all the, the crisp packets, they don't look particularly exciting. But at the time the party was taking place, that was the place to be. That was full of life and full of, of people interacting and chatting each other up. And I think we have to think about Runnymede in those terms as a location like Glastonbury, where in incredibly intense activity happens over a short period of time and builds up lots and lots of debris and rubbish. And that's all left. The morning after or the day after the festival, it looks like a, a rubbish tip. And that's basically what we've got at Runnymede. So although what we might see might be shards of pottery and bone, we have to imagine those within really vibrant party-like events. These represent, if you like, sort of um, seasonal fairs or gatherings of people that have come in from many, many miles around. So it may have acted as a little sort of regional gathering point. You know, and it's also, you know, the power of place within the landscape. You know, the, uh, the fact that these communities would return to that spot. It, it drew them back um, year after year, season after season. Um, uh, and for why? Well, the same reason that, you know, place exerts a pull on us.
you know, that our home, we, we return home again and again and again. Um, or we go to, you know, we go to a concert or, you know, places have a certain mystique. And I think that's, that's a universal thing. By looking at the Runnymede site, individuals do not stand out, but rather a collective humanity. The story being told is not of a small family group, but a large gathering where trade grew, relationships blossomed, and debris was left behind. In many ways, Runnymede was like a prehistoric landfill, but with the right eyes, refuse tells a story. Who did that pink teddy bear belong to? Did they find comfort in its soft fur? And do they miss it at night, now that it's gone? It's very, very common that people ask you what's the most exciting thing you've found as an archaeologist, and they expect you to have found some gold or something like that. But gold are not per se really interesting. I think as an archaeologist, it's the things which tell you about how people lived, which was interesting. In museums, like the British Museum, we often see the examples of the most beautiful and special objects that a society produced. But actually, if we want to understand society as a whole, the more important things are the everyday objects and the evidence of how groups of people interacted in, in sociable ways and in, in parties and at, and, in, and at feasts. On Ronnie, you would dig soil. You would dig burnt stones, burnt flint, uh, things which have been in the cooking fire. You would do small fragments of bones or fragments of pottery. The interesting thing, of course, about the, the Runnymede metalwork is that it doesn't incorporate any of these spectacular finds like swords or spearheads. It's, it's very domestic in its scale. You get pins and buttons and tweezers um, these sorts of small, small objects, but you don't get the spectacular uh, weaponry. Runnymede was so important because it was the first site that demonstrated that these big build-ups of rubbish or middens were really complicated and socially significant. And from that site onwards, from that discovery, from that excavation onwards, those sites were appreciated far more fully. The pottery I thought was very interesting because there was a lot of it and we could reconstruct that, uh, uh, that it's kind of been thrown out as little piles, little heaps, little rubbish heaps. We could reconstruct by seeing how the shirts fitted together, that you had large parts of broken pots which have been thrown out, and so that the original surface would probably have been a lot of dips and peaks and surfaces, a very kind of like a landfill kind of area. Uh, and that was really fascinating. We bring a 21st century um, take on refuse, don't we? It's rubbish, it's dirt, it's to be avoided. It's not something that you want anything to do with. You want it taken away as quickly as possible and disposed of. Well, back in prehistory, it may well be that people had a rather different approach to rubbish and refuse. And it may well simply have represented to them the sort of everyday, um, detritus, which went back into sort of ancestral times. That this, this was a, almost a, a, a sort of spiritual midden, if you like, a, a sort of appeal back to the ancestors, that they had lived on this land, they generated rubbish, we've built on the land ourselves, we've generated our own set of rubbish. Uh, and the rubbish had, it, had a particular resonance to those communities. It wasn't something to be disposed of lightly, it was something to be almost cherished because this, this represented generations of activity on the site. You have intense evidence for consumption of animals and the use of, of ceramics to consume, um, consume food, um, but you also have um, very special, you have special acts of, of deposition of, of um, intentional deposits being made of glass and amber, and you also have evidence of human remains. And that may well represent people burying the dead within the midden. So what you can't do is separate the, the everyday from the special and ritual. One skull was found on a post hole and 
could possibly have been a skull which was sitting on a post. I mean, this particular skull uh, was buried uh, in a post hole, and the suggestion was that it may actually have been placed on top of this post uh, as some sort of marker. It was interesting because at that time we didn't expect to have human remains in the in the mitten. But it was particularly interesting because it was very neatly kind of sitting in the post hole. So it's not like that there had been a post hole and later there was a skull. So you could kind of feel very confident that that skull had originally been on a, probably had been on the post. So that, that was interesting. So it gave you that kind of slight glimpse of a sense of how it might have looked or what was also going on at the place. Also, the other point, of course, about refuse is that it is um, something that you can put back into the ground. It's something you're returning to the ground. It's almost like, you know, I don't know, a, a rose grower manuring his rose beds. He's putting goodness back into the ground to encourage new growth. There may be an element of that going on in terms of this, in terms of this middening. So sites like Runnymede, although they don't contain those fantastic, beautiful objects, tell us a lot more about how society during the Bronze Age worked and the sort of things that were important to people. Pottery specialists are now beginning to sort of examine minutely the makeup of individual pots. And some of them, some of the pots, not only contain the crushed up remains of earlier pots, which have been recycled and remade into a new pot, uh, but some of them also contain crushed up fragments of cremated bone. So it's almost as though you're taking your ancestral past, uh, the bones of, say, your grandma or whatever, crushing them up and then investing them in a pot, as though you're in, in, that pot encapsulates that person or the spirit of that person. We don't know why the skull was on that post as a warning to enemies or perhaps even a sign of respect to their ancestors. Today, we would never consider a detached skull as respectful, but the desire to honor the dead crosses the ages. It has always been hard to let our loved ones go. Just as Bronze Age people infuse their ancestors into pots, today, people keep ashes in urns and can even turn remains into diamonds or tattoo ink. It is difficult to talk about societal structure because so few burials have been found from this period. It is clear though that the river played a fundamental part within the lives of the people here, and possibly in their deaths too. A very large number of cattle, lamb and pig bones were found at Runnymede, yet curiously, for such a prominent riverside settlement, there was very little evidence of fish remains. Did they believe that the souls of the dead deposited from the banks become part of the river? Did grandma's soul become a carp? Were the fish taboo? When you get the Bronze Age, you get new people seemingly coming in, bearing with them new technology in the form of uh, the ability to work metals, copper in particular, and tin, uh, and gold to some extent. The south of England at this period in the late Bronze Age um, suddenly becomes very different to the rest of the country. And that's probably because of the fertility of the soil and also because um, during the late Bronze Age, trade with the continent becomes increasingly important. The Thames Corridor must have acted as a sort of route way into the country um, from Europe and that route way might have had what, for want of a better word, one might call ports or something of the kind, certainly trading settlements, um, actually on the river. So its position on the Thames then becomes crucial because that is the way in which a lot of the trade, a lot of the goods and services and ideas and people are moving. They're moving up and down the river. And so the south of England becomes a much more, um, a much more cosmopolitan place than the rest of the country, potentially. And these middens, of which Runnymede is an example, are concentrated in the south of England and in the west, suggesting this is a very regional identity. This isn't something that's happening across the whole of the country. Runnymede is an example of something that's quite regionally specific, quite special to the south and to the west. It's, 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 there, it's the people in this region's way of expressing themselves. So Runnymede, cited as it is, 
is in a pole position to take advantage of this new sort of upsurge in trade um, that's moving up and down the river. During the Bronze Age, the Thames was hugely important to people's beliefs. And we know that because they are depositing human remains and incredibly prized objects into the Thames in the form of things like swords and shields. And they're intentionally breaking and destroying those objects before they cast them into the Thames. So we know that these are not accidental losses. These are intentional offerings. It looks as though at certain times and in certain places, the river did exert a spiritual pull on the communities who lived along its banks. I think it must be something like the Ganges still is, as it were. It's a, it's a focus, it's, it's a sort of life-giving thing, um, and it becomes a focus for worship in that way. And the fact that Runnymede is positioned on the Thames strongly suggests that they, the people who, who were um, meeting at this site would have, would have worshipped and appreciated the river as an as a, as a important source of, of life and, and, and of death. If your crops and livestock are, are wiped out by the winter floods, then if in some way, if you can appease the, the, I know, the spirit of the river, um, so please, don't, please don't destroy my, my life again. Um, yeah, you would, you would give the most important thing you have to protecting your family, protecting your, you know, your livestock, protecting what is now your space. An enormous amount of wealth, appears, portable wealth, appears to have gone into the river. And it may well have been um, a sort of, um, uh, almost like a sort of peer pressure to, you exerted your social status by being able to afford to throw a lot of stuff into the river. It's like, it's like, I guess, going to buy a Ferrari, having it delivered, no miles on the clock, and then immediately scrapping it. This is the, the most precious thing I have, and I'm using it to um, gain favour with or appease so, you know, my ancestors or, or whatever. You might well end up with uh, having exerted a lot of obligations on other people. They are obligated to match your offerings and go one better. But it could also be seen as, a, um, as an appeal uh, from communities under stress because the Thames, I mean, is a, is a, in flood, is an elemental force. There is very little that prehistoric communities could do about it. So the bronze then, it takes, it takes on a different, a different purpose. It stops being practical, it stops being, you know, um, a sword, which I'll kill somebody with, to something other. In 2014, unprecedented rainfall caused the Thames to burst its banks and flood Runnymede. This may not have been such an unusual sight in the Bronze Age, the people living on its banks would offer their most valuable objects to appease the capricious river and appeal to its mercy. Living at the whims of nature, life was precarious and a flooding river only added stress to an already strained existence. Humans were tremendously successful as hunter-gatherers, but were unable to support large numbers of people. By tying themselves to the land, Bronze Age people could produce more food than ever before to feed the growing population. But this came at a cost. The more successful they were, the harder they had to work to maintain their new lifestyle. It's possible the overworked Bronze Age farmers look back longingly and romanticize the freedom of their ancestors. By the time you get into the late Bronze Age, you then get the rise of things like um, swords, weaponry. So you may well have had some sort of warrior aristocracy rising out of this egalitarian Middle Bronze Age society. You know, you get top people um, who go lording it about and so on, but it's also their job to look after their group of people and stand up to the next job in the next valley who um, is doing the same thing. And every so often they sort of attack one another and one of them's killed and so on and so forth. It just sort of goes on round in circles. I find it hard to believe that humans haven't always been a bit like that.
it's clear that there were social tensions and competition between groups. And, and we see that from the um, number of swords and weapons and spears and shields that are being deposited and that are being used. I mean, social conflict is pretty much endemic. Um, we used to really rather shy away from that as archaeologists, you know, that it was a, it was a kind of rural idyll. Nobody, nobody fought. There was never any strife or warfare. But the more that we begin to interrogate the archaeological data, it becomes quite clear that it, it was a, you know, nature red in tooth and claw. People had to fight to protect what they held. Around the time of Runnymede, around the time that people are living in far more concentrated areas of the country and, and rubbing up against one another and, and, and sort of jostling and competing for space, that's when we start to see tensions between people, it seems. You begin to find um, skeletons with, um, uh, with evidence of edged weapon damage on, their, on the skulls and uh, sort of on the arms as though they've been sort of fighting off uh, attackers. Um, and there's one, there's a famous um, pelvis, human pelvis from further up the Thames Valley with part of a uh, Middle Bronze Age spearhead broken off actually within the pelvis. So this person had been stabbed in the pelvis with a, with a, with a spear which had been driven in with such force that the thing had snapped off. What drives any conflict? Um, jealousy. Um, access to resources, uh, access to marriage partners, anything, anything like that. Well, I mean, this is where archaeology can't really supply answers. It can suggest possibilities, but we can never really get inside people's heads to that extent. It may also be true that as people get slightly bigger groups, can go around and bash a few other people, they don't actually care what they're fighting about. The whole point of the exercise is to go and have a fight with somebody. And that also is a sort of, I think, a probably universal in terms of young male behaviour. But By coming together, people might have avoided um, the tendency to fight or to argue because they have that opportunity to meet one another on, on good terms and to share food and to feast together. That might have been one way that people were able to resolve some of their differences. So perhaps Runnymede represents that kind of more peaceful end of the spectrum. It's about people expressing their um, identity as, as someone from the south of England, as someone who um, lives on, on the Thames and is coming together at this location to meet other people. You always need some uh, element of exchange. You need marriage partners. You, the group cannot survive if they only marry within. So there is a, a, a strong tradition in that kind of society to have events where you do get the opportunity to, um, to, to find a, a future mate. Um, I mean, we have enough trouble with that sort of thing now, let's face it. I don't know if they were falling in love at those fairs. I don't quite know. I'm not, never quite sure whether falling in love is sort of a modern phenomena. Uh, I mean, if they lost, this may be slightly different. So I'm sure you would have had that kind of thing. I think you would. Uh, there might have been a lot of social obligation and social relations, so there might be people you could not exchange with, you could, would not exchange partners with. Uh, and others you would exchange partners with because you wanted to maintain other kind of bartering and other kind of relationships with as well. When you're looking at a site like Runnymede, you need to think about what it was like to live in, in England or in Britain before we all lived in very intense uh, concentrations. At these locations, people were coming together and building those bonds and then dispersing into the wider landscape. The whole composition of society we have to be careful about was not like ours. The concept of family would have been different, marriage probably was different, and things like love and jealousy and all those kind of things, of course, might have existed, but not necessarily like we experience them or how we think about them. And politically, it's uh, very important we understand that gender relations were not necessarily there for the mother sitting at home taking care of things while the father went to work, which is how we have always interpreted it. We have to let the past speak to us through how it works. Try, we have to try that, rather than make the past just what we like it to be, because otherwise we certainly don't learn anything. Will the Runnymede site continue to be important in a thousand years' time?
I hope so. I hope so. Why? <laughs> because it would suggest that we have a culture that still exists in a thousand years, which values past, which values um, a sense of place and space, um, values um, community and belonging and identity. That's quite a nice thing to think we still have in a thousand years' time. I think what's wonderful about humans is that they, throughout time, share very similar uh, interests um, and needs, and those are of good company and of food and of warmth. We can, I say, it goes back to that finding those universal truths. People do things in the same way for the same reasons. I think archaeology kind of you you can make those you you can identify what those traits are i think through archaeology all the evidence suggests that humans share major traits like senses of humor and um, uh, an enjoyment of forms of music and um, language competing in sort of athletic type things all these things i'm sure are commonalities the more we know about difference the less do we take it for granted that the way we are and the way we behave is the only possible way of doing things. And I think that's very, very important. I think that's very important for forward planning. And from a period like the Bronze Age, we can also learn a lot about environmental damage. They did very substantial, they were very greedy, they cut down a lot of areas of Europe, they cut down the last of the forest. Uh, they had very intensive exploitation of the natural environment and a lot of places got destroyed forever. That even then humans were capable of causing things to go wrong um, and we really ought to be doing better by now. So I think we can learn a lot about our impact on the environment. I think we can learn a lot about possible way of responding to that impact by seeing that in different communities they actually do different things. So we can realise that there are different ways to respond, for example, to rising seawater. In a, in a reassuring way, um, it shows, is that human communities can come through all sorts of things like, you know, climatic change uh, and uh, flooding and, uh, and, and still survive. There is, a, there is a thread, a continuity that winds through. I mean, it, it tells us that, um, you know, that prehistoric community at Runnymede were survivors. And I think that, that, that's a very sort of human response. You know, you want to live, you want to thrive, you want to survive, you want to move forward. Um, they were faced with similar sort of climatic change uh, back in the Bronze Age um, and coped with it coped with it in a different way to the way we cope with it now and on a much obviously lesser scale but they were, they were survivors and I think that's one of the big lessons. But we can also look, try to learn why did people respond in different ways, what matters to people, what creates a strong attachment to place. So I think there are lots of, um, lots of thoughts, I don't know if there are lots of lessons but I think there are lots of thoughts and a lot of insight which come from the Bronze Age, which could help us to be more thoughtful in how we make decisions. Objects are important to understanding our humanity because they are extensions of our thoughts and our beliefs, but there are thoughts and beliefs made physical. So they're a way of, of people expressing themselves and of later people understanding those beliefs, particularly when people can't write down their thoughts and ideas. That's all we have. So for Bronze Age people in Britain, all we have to understand their inner thoughts and beliefs are the material objects that they made. But actually, quite fortunately, objects have a way of capturing people's attitudes and beliefs and archaeological sites as a whole, when taken in context, also have a way of recording people's beliefs and behaviours. And if we know how to excavate them and how to record them in detail, as excavators of Runnymede did, we have a much better chance of, of, of interpreting those beliefs and ideas that people had. Is there any sense that the people at Runnymede were 
aware of the idea of communicating across deep time. During the Late Bronze Age, at the same time as Runnymede, we have a number of examples of, of Bronze Age people picking up much earlier objects from the fields in which they're working and collecting them together and depositing them as a, as a hoard so that you get um, modern objects, contemporary objects, as well as much, much older objects that they wouldn't have known about or seen. And in some ways, those collections of materials are Bronze Age people's own museums. So it's fair to say that the same ideas that we have about collecting together objects, you can say that people in the Bronze Age also had. They were interested in the people that came before them and in the objects that they had.